Welcome back to Two Keto Dudes. This is Carl Franklin from Connecticut in the United States. And in February of 2016, I put myself on a ketogenic diet to take control of my metabolism. In just two and a half months, I managed to reverse all my markers of type 2 diabetes with diet alone. As of now, I am 80 pounds lighter with no signs of diabetes or heart disease. Hi, I'm Richard Morris in Canberra, Australia. I've been on a ketogenic diet since April 2014. When I started, I was very sick with complications from type 2 diabetes. Within six months of starting a ketogenic diet, all of my biomarkers of disease had disappeared. I've lost about 100 pounds. I've completely turned my health around. And this show is a document of our experiences thriving for years in ketosis. Yeah, and turning back diabetes. Yeah, and hopefully that might help a few people who are curious about this kind of dietary hacking. We're not doctors. We don't want to give anyone any medical advice, but we are keen to share our own experiences. We're actually both software developers, so we're not afraid of a little technical detail, are we, Carl? Not on your life. (laughs) (laughs) We have done some research into our own deranged metabolisms and the science behind them, and we share studies that we found in the show notes. And you'll probably work out pretty quickly that we're both foodies. Oh, yeah. We love to cook and we love to eat. Mm -hmm. In every episode, we both share a keto recipe that cannot be ignored. (laughs) It cannot. (laughs) So let's start podcast number 124. Catherine Crofts on insulin and Dr. Joseph Kraft. You say you're due for a little? So, Richard, do we have any apologies or corrections from last week's show? Yeah, that was number 123, Dr. Joe Kostrich, low-carbohydrate physician. Um, I don't think we have any uh, complaints about that so far. So, But if you do have any complaints or you want to add something, just let us know. Yeah. Absolutely. So let's revisit what a ketogenic diet is. This is any diet that puts you in a state of nutritional ketosis where you're Mm -hmm. burning fat for fuel and energy to power your body. Mm -hmm. In order to do that, you have to switch from burning glucose as your primary fuel to burning fat as your primary fuel. And how do you do that? Well, let me tell you. It's (laughs) uh, the easiest way, the way we did it anyway, is to eat less than 20 grams of carbohydrates per day, preferably from nuts and green leafy vegetables. And uh, make your protein moderate. And uh, the formula that we used is uh, one to one and a half grams of protein per day for every kilogram of lean body mass you have. What you weighed in high school when you had no body fat. Yeah, but the main thing is just don't eat sugar or starch. Don't eat pasta. Don't eat bread. Don't eat rice. All of these things are starches and sugars that um, uh, are turn into glucose in your blood, and that prevents you from burning fat. That's right. Replace all the sugar and starch in your diet with healthy fat, and you'll be ketogenic in no time. Absolutely. So, Richard, how was your week, sir? Um, It was pretty good, actually. I've got my voice back, which is awesome. And Yeah. yeah, Yeah. I I got my results back from university, and I passed everything, and I got a credit in chemistry, which is outstanding. Outstanding. Yeah, and uh, so uh, now I'm just getting ready for Keto Fest. Uh, that's happening in just like two weeks' time. Right. Um, at, and I'll be flying to um, Connecticut uh, next weekend. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, that's going to be exciting. So we've got to pre-record some podcast episodes, hopefully. And also, we're not announcing anything, but we should say that we're working on a mini Keto Fest in Canberra, Australia in September. Yeah, we are. We? Yeah, and uh, possibly one in Canada as well. Right. And there may be something in Europe. So we'll we'll announce more <laughs> when we know more information. But uh, we're, things are uh, happening. Yeah, yeah, they certainly are. So, uh, how was your week, Carl? Well, my week was busy, of course, busy with work. Uh, my mother's in the hospital with a kind oh, of a strange condition. We don't really know what it is. Mm. On the outside, it kind of looks like heart attack, you know, but Mm. everything comes up clean as a whistle for her. So they really are uh, baffled as to what it is. Right. Anyway, she's dealing with it. They're they're learning more and more every day. And um, I'll keep you posted next week. Mm. Uh, Also, I've been busy with Keto Fest. You know, I'm still working on it. You you know how we give out restaurant coupons, right? Yeah. Yeah. We give everybody 10 bucks off of any Uh, keto dish at participating restaurants, which we publish in the program. Well, RD86 is going to be open for business on Saturday night and taking coupons. Okay, cool. Yeah. So they have indoor and outdoor seating and they'll be cranking out brisket, pork ribs, beef short ribs, and uh, other stuff, all made with no sugar. Excellent. 
Yeah. See, this is the cool thing about RD86 is Robert's like, you know, I look at keto and I say, that's just food. Uh, that's just good food. Hey, it is. It's delicious. <laughs> <laughs> we can do that. We don't even have to tell our customers it's keto. That's just delicious food. Yeah. But the rub on the brisket is just salt and pepper and smoke. Nice. You know, they have outdoor smokers. It's just a, a great place. And my biggest concern with them is getting, they'll get overwhelmed. They don't take reservations. It's first come, first serve. Yeah. And um, the ice cream social is happening there. Right. And the cooking classes as well. The cooking classes are happening there. So they're going to have a busy time on Saturday. Yeah. But uh, yeah, we're finalizing all that stuff, getting the program out. There's a, an ad hoc schedule, as I said last week, up at schedule.ketofest.com. Nice. You can go up there and get the latest yeah i think we're we're going to all of the restaurants now and organizing uh for them to have uh ketogenic meals yep. and we're going to have a list of all the restaurants that are participating and the way that it works is we give everybody who comes to keto fest ten dollars they they can then go to any of the restaurants on the list who are participating mm -hmm. and use that ten dollars to get ten dollars off their bill and then right. we go around the week afterwards to all the restaurants and pay them $10 for every coupon they give us. So exactly. you know, it's, it's a nice kind of arrangement that uh, makes sure that uh, that restaurants in town are, are doing ketogenic meals. And I tell you, people come up to us after this Keto Fest event in tears at how wonderful yeah. it was to go to a restaurant that was prepared for keto. Yeah, and just not feel weird. Yeah. yeah, that's it. <laughs> well, Richard, let's give away some swag. Yeah, every show we pick a lucky winner at random from the members of the Two Keto Dudes fan club. Yes, and today we're giving away a treasure trove of stuff from vendors we like, all of which you can find at fanclub.twoketo.com. So who is our winner this week? Today's winner, Richard, is Abby Nadig. Congratulations, Abby. <laughs> let's tell everybody what Abby has won. Yeah, well, the first thing we're giving away is a Two Keto Dudes coffee mug that says, Keep Calm and Keto On. Mm, nice. And a signed copy of Lies My Doctor Told Me by Dr. Ken Berry. And a bottle of Stevia Sweet Barbecue Sauce. This was developed by a barbecue restaurant owner who plans to change the restaurant industry forever. This sauce is full flavored and only one gram of sugar with two carbs per serving. Yeah, we looked into this sauce and it turns out that the one gram of sugar comes from the Worcestershire sauce. It's not a yeah. primary ingredient, but Worcestershire sauce is one of their ingredients and it has some sugar in it. Yeah. Yeah, we spoke to the people who made the sauce and they had tried multiple alternative ingredients and they weren't able to find an alternative that tasted right. Yeah. So they used the least amount of Worcestershire sauce that they could use to get the taste right. Yeah. Uh, now, personally, I don't generally need barbecue sauce on food myself, but look, if I had a teenager complaining that they weren't able to use regular barbecue sauce, I would not hesitate. Absolutely. Have you seen how much sugar is in regular barbecue sauce? Oh, yeah. This is something Peter Bruckner told us. It's 60% sugar. A one-liter yep. bottle of barbecue sauce, fountain barbecue sauce in Australia, and probably the same for US barbecue sauce, mm. has 600 grams of sugar in it. Yeah, that's obscene. You it know, is. there is room in the keto community for products like this. Uh, Rao's mm. tomato sauce, or Rao's, for example, that's exactly. three grams of sugar per half cup. And if you're mm. going to use a little of it for your chicken parm or fathead pizza, Carl's head pizza, you just you just have to know how it affects you. So I really mm. like a little of this sauce when I get a barbecue Jones, and it doesn't kick okay. me out of ketosis. Um, by the way, it's also going to be available at the Keto Fest Pig Roast and at RD86 nice. on Saturday night. Yeah. So there's more stuff. Yeah, we've got a cheese making kit from Pamela Zorn. Absolutely. We're putting one of these cheese making kits in the Keto Fest attendee bag. And Pam is also going to be at Keto Fest at Thames River Greenery doing cheese making demonstrations. Yeah. So mm. everybody at Keto Fest is going to be able to go home and make fresh cheese. Do you remember the burrata that she brought to Breckenridge? Oh. Oh, that was absolutely. some of the best burrata I've ever had in my life. Yeah. And burrata is yeah. like a fresh mozzarella that's made from cream. And it's yeah. got a creamy center. Oh. Well, you know, Jules makes <laughs> uh, cheese here and I do yeah. the mozzarella. So when we do a Carl's Head pizza, we make fresh mozzarella. It takes about 30 minutes to make. And, mm. oh, man, the taste is, <laughs> is, is out of this world. So, And you make it from cream? Oh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. So as Carl said, we're putting in one of these kits in every bag. So everybody who comes to Keto Fest will get an opportunity to go make some cheese. Yeah. Of course, if you don't want to wait to win some swag, you can buy all sorts of swag online at gear.2keto.com. Right. And now it's time for my favorite segment. <laughs> <laughs> what you got, Carl? 
Never gets old. <laughs> All right. Well, this comes from the ketogenic forum from the great big public keto before and after thread, which you can read at success.2keto.com. Yeah. This is where we ask people to tell their stories with an, with the idea that, hey, these are public. You're putting your before mm. and after photos out there. They're going to be public. Mm. So anyway, this one is, I lost 45 pounds in 120 days, September through December, by cutting all grains, sugar, and processed foods and doing intermittent fasting. Nice. I did go all the way to keto in October, and I'm still keto now. I've been coasting so far this year and maintaining that 45-pound loss without any additional effort and only fasting 16 hours a day, five days per week, only occasionally tossing in a two- or three-day fast. I still haven't been able to work in a regular exercise program except for my daily morning 20-minute yoga practice, mm -hmm. but it's not an aversion to exercise, which would have been the case a year ago. Just too much travel and disruption to routine to get a habit to stick. I'm yeah. going to focus on at least getting in 30 minutes of walking per day. I plan to ramp back up on intermittent fasting and tighten up on keto over the next three months and attempt to tackle those last 15 pounds. And this is from Tina, by the way. And Tina goes on to say, I'd slowly been gaining weight over the last 12 years. Mm. I thought the middle age spread was inevitable and that I'd never be able to get back to my normal weight. I'd been pre-diabetic since at least 2013, but the doctors were so focused on my naturally high LDL that they didn't even mention my A1C. Yeah. yeah tell me about it. <laughs> it's ridiculous. They're like, A1C, what's that? <laughs> yeah. But you look healthy because your LDL is nice and low. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Meanwhile, your great. glucose is getting shot to, to ribbons. <laughs> Uh, she goes, this is interesting because Carrie Brown brought this up. She says, my latest blood test, my HDL is up to now uh, 72, mm -hmm. which is amazing. Triglycerides yeah. down in the 60s. A1C up a bit to 5.3, which is mm -hmm. amazing. Yeah. Uh, getting back to a regular IF protocol should improve that. Inflammatory markers are improved thanks to the fact that my new doctor ran a full cardiometabolic panel, which picked up a common MTHFR gene mutation that I have, and just a change in multivitamin to one that contains methylated B vitamins took care of several issues. Nice. That was, that was Carrie Brown's thing, right? Yeah, I have the same mutation. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm lucky enough that I don't have that uh, susceptibility to, to methylated B, B vitamins, but, um, you know, I have, a, I have a, a, a less severe form of it, but uh, mm. I'm certainly uh, I'm using that to, to determine how I uh, supplement my own uh, diet. Yep. And Tina goes on to say, I know all my friends and family pretty much groans and rolls their eyes when I post podcasts <laughs> and YouTube videos about low carb and functional medicine approaches to health. This is my N equals one result. And I see hundreds of others here every day. People that have been able to go off of diabetic meds, anxiety and depression meds, and reverse many other health issues. We may never be as thin or strong as we once were, but needn't resign ourselves to being sick and tired the rest of our lives. That's amazing. And one last thing she says, by the way, I had a coronary calcium scan done and have zero calcification. Booyah. Booyah. That's a 15-year warranty against heart disease. Yeah. So much for LDL corresponding to heart disease. <laughs> Watch The Widowmaker on Netflix to learn more about the $130 scan that actually looks for heart disease and could save your life. Yeah. Well said. Well said, Tina. And you know, yep. I know you've lost 45 pounds and you'd like to lose 10 more but you're effortlessly able to keep that weight off with a lifestyle that you love you're not having to eat horrible food right keto diets are delicious and you know how unlikely it is for you to lose weight and keep it off it's something yeah. like five percent of people who diet are able to do that so the fact right. that you're able to do this is outstanding high five high five tina well yeah. done Mm -hmm. So, who's talking to you, Richard? So, I've got a quick one. This is a review on Facebook. This is from okay. Camaro, and Camaro says, life-changing dudes. I'm crying <laughs> while I'm typing this. Wow. I cannot explain the impact that the dudes are having on my spouse and myself. We're on board with you and will never return to the old way of eating. I just want you to know the impacts you're making on lives is remarkable. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts. We love you. Oh, we love you back, Camaro. We love you back. Mm -hmm. You know, the thing that comes up over and over again in my mind when I feel guilty about the spoils of the ketogenic diet, right? You know, the right, riches. Yeah. What do you call it? Spoil of riches? 
Is yeah. that Conan Kaipia? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it, yeah, people have a tendency, because this is how we've been thinking all these years, to right. think that it's some magic bullet like the magic pill right you know mm. it, it just cures everything but you know it the, the keto diet doesn't cure you your body cures you right your body cures you all we're doing is taking away the stuff that has been preventing it from healing yeah. itself for all these years that's it yeah that's keto that's isn't a miracle true. your body is a miracle but the bounty is yeah. an embarrassment of riches that's the embarrassment of riches <laughs> yeah that's right <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're going to roll the uh, conversation that you, Richard, had with Catherine Crofts in Zurich. Why don't you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, so we really intended to have a conversation on the record in Breckenridge, but unfortunately in Breckenridge, uh, Dr. Crofts had lost her voice. And yeah. so she, she and I had this full-on conversation um, uh, using uh, mime and interpretive dance <laughs> 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 on the subject of insulin, but it wouldn't uh, actually uh, uh, translate well to a podcast audience. <laughs> no, so we had to really. wait until we next met, which was in Zurich just a couple of weeks ago. And the funny thing is I – kind of had lost my own voice so uh, so anyway it's it's one of these things every every time we meet one of us can't talk uh, right. but luckily enough she did all the talking here and uh, let's roll the interview I'm here in Zurich with uh, Catherine Crofts and she's a researcher from the uh, Auckland University of Technology and uh, she's just going to say hi. Hello. Yeah. And she is, as you can tell, she's from New Zealand. And uh, we have been here at a conference for the past three and a half days. Uh, and initially it was a nutrition conference with a lot of famous people like Walter Willett and Jenny Brand Miller and uh, Darius Mosafarian and a lot of low-carb people like uh, uh, Gary Taubes and Nina Teicholz, Stephen Finney. And then the last one and a half days has just been low carbers and we had a big round table where we we uh, spoke about the nature of the low carb world and uh, Catherine is actually an expert I call her the Yoda of insulin <laughs> but the last time we met was in Breckenridge and she'd lost her voice and this time around I've lost my voice so I'm going to let her do most of the talking <laughs> so um, at, at Breckenridge she spoke about Dr. Kraft's data and uh, maybe you'd like to to tell us about that. Dr. Croft's data. Um, Dr. Croft was an absolutely wonderful, generous man with huge vision. In the 1950s, they changed the law, that's actually about 1945, 1946, and put radioisotopes from the care of the military into the care of the civilians. And as part of that, they, it was about 1939 that they had discovered uh, radioactive iodine and that was then, they'd worked out that they can use that as a marker for a lot of different biometabolic uh, markers, right. such, as, such as insulin. And, but it took, as part of the 1946 law change, pathologists who wanted to work with radioisotopes mm -hmm. had to undertake a training course with um, a PhD certified physicist to say that they were, could safely and appropriately handle the radioisotopes. Right. Dr. Kraft did that in 1955. One of the things, though, that he had done is when he was teaching at medical school, he was teaching a class on diabetes. Hmm. And it was recognized at the time that there was a hyperinsulinemic uh, form of diabetes. But he realized that nobody had ever studied or quantified the amount of insulin that was there in these people and whether the early diagnosis of looking at insulin responses and insulin assays could help predict the, um, the development of type 2 diabetes. So 1960, Yellow uh, developed the first radio immunoassay for yeah. insulin and it was the late 60s, early 1970s before there was a commercial unit that Dr. Kraft um, bought for himself because he was contracted to this hospital, St. Joseph's Hospital in Chicago and they started assaying everybody to be able to collect together a data pool to, for Dr. Kraft to be able to work out the relationship between insulin, insulin response patterns and the uh, and glucose and the development of type 2 diabetes. Yeah. So over the following 20 years, uh, all of his physician friends in the hospital would refer their patients to him 
For a three to five hour 100 gram oral glucose tolerance tests where he assayed glucose and insulin in samples taken at baseline mm-hmm. and they got their glucose drink. Yep. 30 minutes, 60 minutes, 120 minutes and 180 minutes. Now those were the patients but he also got a large number of we have no idea who they were, healthy volunteers. Yeah. Now, this included the doctors. Mm-hmm. Dr. Kraft was in there many times. Yeah. Some of his family got theirs done. So was, was this supposed to be a control? Is that no, the idea? No, it was, it was cross-sectional. It was a convenient sample, cross-sectional. Okay. He was trying to get together patterns and information, and he published on this for the first time in 1975 mm. with about 3,500 patterns. And it was published in the Journal of... Oh, heck, I've forgotten. Mm-hmm. It was a pathological journal. It was a right. journal of laboratory Cause pathology. Because he was a pathologist. He right? was a yeah. pathologist. Mm. But this is in the days before Google. Yeah. It was in the days where there was a very glucose-centric model to the treatment of diabetes. So, Not if, a lot has changed since then, I'm no, afraid. No, not a lot has changed since then. <laughs> that was very obvious over the last couple of days. Yeah. But the, the information got lost. Hmm. And while he'd sent out his information to a lot of places, he uh, attended many conferences, he spoke, he could never get traction with the treatment of type 2 diabetes. So he, Really? Yeah, really. He tried. He, this was his life's work, and he poured his heart and soul into it. He got some traction with the treatment of migraines, uh, vertigo and tinnitus. Right, yeah. And many ears disease as many well. Many ears yeah. disease, yes. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's a little bit of traction there. Was that with Kenneth Brookler? Uh, That's with Brookla? Kenneth Brookler. Right. Yes, yeah. but also with some other otolaryngologists. Um, but it never really got any further. And a lot of the articles he submitted to journals were rejected. <sighs> so I've got some of his rejection rejected letters. Mar- <laughs> not, not his rejection letters, but his rejected manuscripts. Oh, okay. Okay, so he sent me so much stuff. So then what happened is he's now got 15,000 samples and he decides he needs, he, he needs to write his memoirs for his grandchildren. Right. Right. And somebody, I forget who, uh, persuaded him that he should not just write it for his grandchildren, he should publish the book. Yeah. This book was self-published mm-hmm. by uh, Trafford Publishers and it's there on Amazon, but he printed it off hundreds, if not, well, actually probably into the thousands of copies and sent them all the way around the world to endocrinologists, diabetologists, wow. cardiologists, um, anybody who thought might be interested and might be able to take up some of this work and got no traction. Wow. So in 2013, after I'd started my PhD, my PhD was originally going to be on the investigation of cardiorespiratory fitness and metabolic disease. So by background, I am a pharmacist. Right, yeah. Okay, I came into research because over the 20 years that I had been practicing, I'd seen people, you know, when I first started practicing in 1997, I had a patient pointed out to me who was going to be so unusual, I'd likely never see another patient like this one again. Okay. He had type 2 diabetes, but he was only 28. Right. Back in 1997, type 2 diabetes was extremely rare in anybody under the age of 40, which is why it was known as adult onset diabetes. Wow. I got mine at uh, age 38 in 2003. That's when I first became um, Yeah, and, 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 and you were, and you were the, on the group of people. We were starting to see it at younger and younger ages. Yeah. Do you want to know the scary thing? What's that? In Japan, this is a study from Japan, when diabetes is being diagnosed in children, and oh, I'm talking... Type 2 of, diabetes. Type 2 diabetes is outweighing type 1 diabetes. Mm. If you're a child in Japan being diagnosed with diabetes, you're more likely to have type 2. It's horrible. It is really horrible because the when you look at the long-term pathologies of uh, diabetes... When you've got type 1 diabetes, we need to keep things under control to reduce your risk of cardiovascular disease. Right. Right. With type 2 diabetes, you're almost guaranteed to get cardiovascular disease, renal disease, diseases of the eyes, diseases of the small vessels in your fingers, toes. And we're trying to keep things under control so it's not too out of hand. Tim Noakes calls it a disseminated vascular disease. So did Dr. Kraft. Did he really? Wow. Yes. Mm. 
Okay, it's a cardiovascular disease. Diabetes was a cardiovascular disease. He'd seen this from so many of his autopsies. Oh, he, of course, he'd done these autopsies as well. So the problem is with type 1 diabetes is where the way it's been currently managed over the years with the highs and lows of the insulin, trying to manage the, the food. Because in the 1980s, the insulins we had were far less sophisticated than the ones we've got now. Yeah, bovine insulin back then. Well, we make it oh, now. Oh, no, no, no. We, 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 we've gone beyond bovine insulin. Okay, good. Because okay. I know we make it now from yeast. We, we, yeast and bacteria. Right. It's genetically modified. It's one very good purpose of genetically modifying I, I have organisms. no problem with GMOs. <laughs> um, but we only had two really back then. Mm. We had act rapid or a short acting insulin duration of action of about six hours. Right. So what that meant was if you had your insulin half an hour before your breakfast, mm. your breakfast would have worn off long before your insulin would have worn off. So you had to, had to have morning tea. <sighs> right. You had to have so many snacks. Yeah. And the thing about when you're trying to treat type 1 diabetes is you have to be a mind reader. Mm. You don't have your insulin to control what's happened and where your blood glucose is now. Mm. You're trying to mind read everything you're going to do in the future. Oh, right. And any activity is going to change that. Yeah. You know, are you running late for your bus? So are you going to sprint yeah. that last bit? That's going to change Somebody ca cuts you off in traffic. Somebody cuts you off in traffic. <laughs> right. Somebody pounces on you and says, we need to do a podcast. <laughs> that would be me. <laughs> yeah. But all of those things can affect your food. You, you miss a meal by accident right. or your food that you promised at lunch isn't quite up to standard. Yeah. All of those things will change your blood glucose response and your insulin response. So nobody's a mind reader. People either overshoot or undershoot, which means that they then either have to have more food or more insulin to compensate. So over the years, most people with type 1 diabetes will see their insulin requirements creep up. Yeah. They're actually developing Double diabetes. Oh, that's the worst case. And it's also people with type 2 can also become in, can also lose their pancreatic function and get double diabetes as well. It, no, that's not double diabetes. I'm no. going to correct you on okay. that one. Okay, somebody with type 2 diabetes yep. will never... Okay, it ne okay th there's a whole lot of really complicated subtypes of diabetes. Okay. But if we're sticking to the basic type 1, type 2s, mm -hmm. type 1 is a total loss of beta cell function. Right. In... Very, very simplistic terms. I know there's lots of nuances out there. Autoimmune, the autoimmune. It's autoimmune, yeah. but it's a total loss of pancreatic function. Right. Type 2 diabetes is actually overcompensation. It's a hyperinsulinemic condition. I've seen this from looking at Dr. Kraft's work. Mm. And what happens there is um, people with type 2 diabetes are actually super producers of insulin. Mm, yes. And when I say super producers, my God, I mean super producers of insulin. Right. Despite being a super producer of insulin, mm. their blood glucose levels go up because what they've got is inadequate compensatory hyperinsulinemia to cope with the degree of insulin resistance that they've got. Right. So if your degree of insulin resistance mm. exceeds your pancreas's ability to compensate, yes. then you need, generally need to use insulin to um, manage your insulin resistance and get over your insulin resistance. That is not double diabetes. Okay. Double diabetes, to me, at any rate, and my definition, I'm going to move forward with double diabetes, <laughs> is somebody with type 1 diabetes, autoimmune, total loss of pancreatic function, who over the years, yes. through challenges with management, has developed a sufficient degree of insulin resistance Right to need a same dose of insulin as somebody with type 2 diabetes. Right, so they need, need more and more insulin as time goes they on. They need because, more and more yeah. insulin as time goes on. And it's the insulin that causes a lot of the pathophysiologies, the cardiovascular disease, the Alzheimer's disease, the right. stroke risks, the cancer risks. That's high levels of insulin. Yeah. We've attributed that to that in many years previously to the high glucose. Right. But you do not get high glucose without having high insulin at the same time. <laughs> yeah. um, I teased out as part of my PhD the differences between the high insulin mechanistically in those disease states yeah. and the high glucose mechanistically to those disease states. Mm and epidemiologically. And I'm going to say that a lot of those challenges we have are associated with high insulin. Having diabetes, especially type 2 diabetes, is the number one risk form 
for having developing Alzheimer's disease. Yes. To the extent that some pieces in the literature refer to Alzheimer's as type 3 diabetes. Right. Major risk form for so many different cancers. Mm -hmm. Major risk form for so many different forms of cardiovascular disease. Yep. But you can develop the same issues with Alzheimer's, cancer, cardiovascular disease with high levels of insulin yeah. without necessarily having a high glucose level. Yeah. Which to me, it says it's the insulin. It's, it is. That's the, that's that's the, the issue. causal factor. So yeah. I got through all of that. And I'm, you know, with my PhD, I got through that degree of yeah. theory. And now I'm going, I kind of need to test this. Mm. And from what I'd seen, um, two hours and two hour oral glucose tolerance test wasn't sufficient. Yeah. It needed to go to three to four hours. And at this point, I knew nothing about Dr. Kraft's work. I had a $4,000 PhD budget, mm -hmm. which to be able to do the bloods that needed to be done, my sample size was going to be minuscule. Yeah, sure. So we went back to the literature, mm -hmm. trying to find, was there a study that's done this already? And will there be some data available? Or is this something that will feed into a controlled trial that I right. can do? No luck, no luck, no luck. I went to the World Wide Web. And I have never been able to retrace my search oh. strategy. <laughs> but it was successful. <laughs> there was some message board somewhere. Yeah. And it's some obscure thing that said, need to look at Dr. Kraft's 1975 paper. Wow. Was it from an endocrinologist who'd been sent this no, stuff? Or? No, it, it, was, it was a layperson. Oh, okay. There you uh, go. Somebody doing their, their self-research. There's been so many people doing self-research on this for years. Yeah. Somebody had found the 1975 paper. The only copy I could find on the internet was somebody who had scanned it and posted it. And you've got all these underlines and hand scribbled nice. notes. <laughs> yeah. And um, I went, wow, this is exactly what I'm looking for. He's got all these hand-drawn patterns and he's already worked out these patterns, which I'm thinking in my vision, yeah. this has to be out there. We need to be looking at these patterns. So he identified, what was it, five different patterns? Five different patterns. From what your insulin does after you eat something. So this is, or specifically you eat glucose. Yeah, so, so in this particular case, he had these oral glucose tolerance tests. He was doing about six to seven assays a day, six days of the week. And he, all of his graphs, and I've got his graphs at home. They're yeah. beautiful. They're hand-drawn. His handwriting is impeccable on these notes. When you see his hand, handwriting in other notes, it's <laughs> virtually illegible to me, and I'm a pharmacist. <laughs> and he's a doctor. And he's a doctor. Yeah. As yeah. a case of most people can't read it, so I'm struggling with bits of his handwriting. Um, but his handwriting's beautiful, impeccable. And he'd go home, and he would work out how to identify these patterns. Kevin, his son, told me he used to spread them out all over the kitchen floor and yeah. the study floor and, and try and line things up. Yeah, wow. And he came up with those five patterns. Uh, pattern one, he called normal. Mm -hmm. Then there was patterns 2A, 2B, which were defined by uh, magnitude of area under the curve, essentially. Yeah. Pattern three was a delays, delayed first phase insulin response or a loss of first phase insulin response. Right. So they, these people peaked at two hours or later as opposed to patterns 1, 2A and 2B who peaked at 30 to 60 minutes. Sure. Then there was pattern 4. Pattern 4 was defined as a very, very high fasting level. Now with patterns 1, 2s and 3, you really can't tell from a fasting level what the rest of their postprandial response is going right. to be. Pattern four, you can. Mm -hmm. They were above 50. This is massively high. Yeah. It's one and a half, it's at least one and a half times what Dr. Kraft considered to be a normal fasting insulin level. Now, Dr. Kraft defined a normal fasting insulin level as he took the average of his first three and a half thousand people, worked at the mean, Three standard deviations, the space yeah, basic stats, yeah. Three standard deviations to find the normal population. Yeah. And that came up with 30. Mm. So when I've redone the maths and I've looked at people with normal glucose tolerance, because he looked at everybody, whether they had diabetes or not. Right. So we want to bring it back to being a normal um, insulin level. We need to look at the population with people with normal glucose tolerance. Mm. And when I looked at his patterns, you know, his patterns again. Um, with the exception of pattern four, mm -hmm. all of the other patterns overlap. Now, if I took his normal insulin response pattern in people with normal glucose tolerance, yep. there was a mean of seven and a standard deviation of five, mm -hmm. which puts us at a range of uh, seven plus 15 is what, 22? 22, yeah. So he's suggesting that 22 microunits per mil under this system would be normal. But then you look at, he had defined his pattern 2A as being 
borderline. Right. So do we consider borderline people to be normal or not? And when you look at their fasting insulins, it's very, very similar. I what was it, 7, 11, 9 okay. as a mean and a standard deviation of about 7. So when you do the math and get the three standard deviations, I think it worked out to be about 31 or 32. Right. They were his borderline normals. If the others we accept as abnormals, the, when you take into account the mean and standard deviation, it's over 30. Yeah. But when you take into account 1 and 2a, I still say his... Um, uh, under 30 is still absolutely diagnostic yeah. for fasting insulin. But fasting insulin does not predict postprandial response. No, so the difference there really is a fasting insulin is like trying to measure an, a car engine when it's up on blocks, whereas the, the, the glucose tolerance, you're measuring it running down the freeway. Well, and it's, it's, it's going to give you much it, different it's, information. It's that, Kraft described, it's not just running down the freeway, Kraft described his glucose test as a maximal pancreatic stress test. Oh, okay. So to take your analogy, I would say you're trying to run at freeway speeds up a massive hill. Okay, fair enough. Okay, so it's not just freeway, but we want that maximal load. And a lot of cars are not going to make motorway speed no. going up a hill. They're going to crash and burn. And that's what you can see when you do the postprandial result. Yeah. So this allows you to see somebody who's going to be diabetic in 10 or 15 years' time, doesn't it? Well, yes and no. I, and my supervisors hated that. Grant mm -hmm. Schofield especially hated it when I come back and say, well, yes and no. Mm -hmm. Dr. Kraft never did any long-term outcomes. Right. So he has no longitudinal data. There is no longitudinal data. There's no long-term – well, I take it back. We've got a couple. Yeah. of longitudinal samples, but there is nothing really to say we've got good quality longitudinal data. Yeah. But there was a study done by Hayashi and colleagues published in 2013, and I can right. get you the reference. Yes. They looked at 400 Japanese-American men li living in Seattle. And they came up with this independently, didn't they? They came up with this independently. Yeah. They've also looked at insulin response patterns. They didn't look at the magnitude of the response. They just looked at the relative peaks and troughs and when people peaked and troughed. Hmm. But people who peaked at two hours whichever way it, you know, it was a case of low slowly going up an absolute peak at two hours or whether there were some ups and downs before they got to two hours, they had about a 40% risk of developing type 2 diabetes over the next five to 10 years. Wow. If your insulin peaked at 30 to 60 minutes, mm -hmm. you had a under 16% chance, and I think it was about under 7% chance if it was 30 and 15% chance if it was 60 minutes. Right. But we're still talking about a 15% chance compared to a 40% chance yeah. of developing type 2 diabetes at five to 10 years. The two big flaws with that study is the only people they excluded were those people with already frank type 2 of diabetes. Course, yeah. Um, so people with pre-diabetes being impaired fasting glucose or impaired glucose tolerance, tolerance yeah. were highly prevalent in the sample. But people with impaired glucose tolerance or impaired fasting glucose, don't quite quote me on the impaired fasting glucose, but definitely impaired glucose yeah. tolerance, were more likely to have a lost their first phase insulin response. Gotcha. So if you've got somebody with normal glucose tolerance who's lost their first phase insulin response, I'm not going to say it's 40% over the next 5 to 10 years, yeah. but it's going to be at least 40% chance over the next 10 to 20 years. Right, yeah. So if you've lost your first phase insulin response... You can see it's happening. You can see it's happening. Yeah. You cannot predict that from fasting insulin. Right. And I have tried. Yeah. No, so I, you know, I, everyone in, on the, in the keto world sort of likes these fasting insulin tests. I don't so I'm like not the sure fasting they, insulin test. They tell you nothing. Yeah. So, okay. So, so I think they tell you something. If you've got 50, if you, that look, tells you something diagnostic. Okay. If you're over 30. Right. Houston, we've got mine, a problem. Mine was a 39, my, the first one I ever took. So, right. You know? Yeah, and, and again, I'm going to emphasise this is micro units per mole, not picomoles per litre. Yes. So if it's over 30, you know you've got a problem. Yeah. If it's under 30, mm -hmm. I cannot tell you. People keep coming up to me and saying, my fasting glucose is four. Isn't that wonderful? And I'm going, well, what's it going to be like tomorrow? <laughs> you know, what, what's it like after a meal? What's it, what's it like in three minutes? <laughs> what's it, well, yeah, three to five minutes because insulin oscillates. Yeah. It's not at steady so, state. So interesting thing, my first endocrinologist in the, when I was first diagnosed with prediabetes in Las Vegas, Elias Samuels, he he's the guy that 
discovered that the the pulsatility of insulin going up and down. I, I think I think I've got his paper. Yeah, he was also the second guy. He was like the first person in Europe to do a, a radioimmune uh, assay of insulin. Nice. So yes, nice. Yeah. And did you know that this is one of the reasons why poor sleep increases the risk of insulin resistance? Is that right? So what happens is when you sleep, you go through. It's, you, it's called a sleep architecture. Yeah. You go through stages of um, slow wave sleep in different ways is deep wave sleep but your brain during sleep switch from sympathetic dominance to parasympathetic dominance as part of this right. good quality sleep architecture yeah. you just stir and insulin secretion goes up and down with the shift between sympathetic and parasympathetic dominance it's like tides in the body like tides in the body your sleep gets disturbed your insulin's disturbed. Ah. It's one of the reasons if you have a crappy night's sleep, you're desperate for those sweet cards at three o'clock in the afternoon. There you go. So I, I went for like 20 years as a software developer, able to function on four and a half hours of sleep every night. And that could have contributed to me Maybe. falling over the cliff in the end. Maybe. Who knows? Yeah. But sort of coming back to you know, so the Dr. Craft story, I, as I said, I found this message board thing. <laughs> right. So I found his 1975 paper and went, what else has he written? And I found his book, and it was the version I got was in 2011, mm -hmm. and this is in 2013. So I'm going. He looks quite sprightly <laughs> on the on the back of the book. Yeah. Wonder if he's still around. How do I get in contact with him? Plucked up my courage, and I tried emailing the uh, addresses for correspondence on his papers. But those email addresses were so old they were no longer. Yeah, they no they longer existed. They kept bouncing. <laughs> yeah. So I wrote to his publisher and said, I've got some more questions about this book. Could you either please pass me on his email address or forward my email to him? They said, we forwarded it on your email because privacy, we're not going to yeah. give you his email address. Sure. He wrote back. Wow. He was very excited. <laughs> I was very excited. And you may be the first person who actually responded. I'm one it, of the first person who have it's, responded. It's like he's a castaway and he's thrown out messages in a bottle yes, for he 20 has. or 30 years yes, and finally and I, and I, and someone from New Zealand. Has, his bottle is washed up on my shore <laughs> 20 years later. Exactly. And, or 40 years 40 later. 40 years later, all yeah, right. But it's um, – so we, we corresponded a couple of times with emails and he would tell me where to look in his book and and my cop, my working copy of his book, I've got things underlined, I've got post-it notes. It's my working copy. I've got a pristine copy as well, which he signed for me, but I have well, a working copy. Yeah. And after a while, we, we made a telephone call. Mm. And at the end of that telephone call, <laughs> you have no idea what it took me to pluck up my courage and say um, – by any chance, do you still have some of this data available? Right. Could I please reanalyze it? Could you send? Could I please reanalyze it? He said, "I've got a CD. I've got a CD here somewhere. It's got three hundred files on it. I'll post it to you." Wow! <laughs> now I'm expecting three hundred scanned, hand-drawn graphs. Right. Yeah. That's what I'm expecting. So the CD arrives in the post. And I put it in my computer, yep. and my computer cannot read it. Oh, no. It's in DOS. <laughs> right. The CD was last yeah. copied in yeah. 1999. Oh, gee. <laughs> so I go out to my IT department and I'm going, Can anyone this read is this? In DOS. Can you translate <laughs> it for me, please? They're going, Sure, you'll have to leave it with us. Do you understand how precious and absolutely how priceless this data is? Right. I'm literally clutching it to my chest. They're going, It doesn't change anything. You're still going to have to hand it over. But the ones. Two hours later, I get home. I got an email from the IT department. Mm -hmm. They say, yep, got a conversion program, no problems. I've copied the largest file for you. I hope this is what you're after. Yeah. And I opened it up and I see a spreadsheet. Oh, wonderful. And That's how you want data, right? Have you ever had those moments where your brain has just gone, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, to the extent that you can't articulate anything. So I'm, because you, you're wordless, which is unusual for you. Very well. I was, I was, I was coming up with glubs and glubs. Uh, uh, so I wasn't quite wordless, but it was nothing coherent because there was 15,000 records. Uh, there was the glucose results, yep. the insulin results. Oh, wonderful. This is what Kraft had already published on. Mm. There was more. There was age. There was gender. <gasps> He's published on those in his book. Yeah. Then there was height and weight. Wow. That so had never well. yeah. been published on before. Yeah. And his work on 
age and gender had never been in a peer review publishing before. Right. 15,000 records. I jumped up screaming, scared the cat. <laughs> Husband's trying to work out what's going on and I cannot articulate anything. And he's looking at a page of numbers going, yeah. well, I still have no how, idea what's going did, on. How does this affect my wife? Like how does this affect my wife like this? <laughs> so I went through and wrote a paper with my wonderful PhD supervisors, Grant Schofield, Karen Zinn, yeah. Mark Weldon. You, you, nobody ever hears anything about Mark. I've never read him, yeah. Mark is a biostatistician who now works with the United Nations, but without his very careful patience teaching me about statistics, what I know about statistics before my PhD, you could write on a grain of rice. <laughs> now I could probably write it on a blueberry, but my stati- everybody comes up to me and talks about the statistics in my PhD and I'm going, that was Mark working yeah. out my methodology. So Mark, thank you so yeah. much. And Dr. Kraft was also a co-author on that paper. Wow. So he finally got to be co-author on, on a, a paper, published paper, on a published paper that made a mainstream diabetes journal talking about hyperinsulinemia a year before he died. Yeah, that's remarkable. Yeah. He, he died actually the week before Breckenridge. Yeah, uh, Breckenridge 2017. Yeah, yeah. Yes. You gave an interesting talk at Breckenridge 2018 where you basically did a harker at the beginning of the... <laughs> no, you, it you... wasn't a harker. <laughs> okay. It was a, the, the, no, it's all right. Um, if you don't know Tereo, it's... Um, it's a blessing that you gave. I gave a karakia. It was a blessing. It was a blessing to the meeting uh, to say that, uh, roughly translated, it said that in these beautiful mountains, let us come together, let our minds be open so that we can learn from each other. One of the things that the Māori do in a meeting like this is also acknowledge their ancestors who have gone before because they have led the way. Right. And you acknowledge the Sky Father and the Earth Mother as what's nourishing to bring you towards that. And when I acknowledge the ancestors, I acknowledge Joseph Kraft right. as the ancestor of yeah. my research. That's a very emotional moment. I think that was the first presentation at Breckenridge. That got the whole conference off to a great start. It was a very emotional moment. Yeah. I, not just for me, but I think for a lot of people yeah, out there. Yeah, for me as well. Yeah. Yeah. So in my in my thesis, so I'm probably going to get a bit emotional on you. You're probably going to be meditating. Um, I said in my thesis, when I dedicated it. To not a dedication to Dr. Kraft, but I acknowledged him because he wasn't, he wasn't dead at that point. Yeah. So it wasn't a dedication. I said, um, Isaac Newton said, if I have seen further than most, it's because I've stood on the shoulders of giants. Right. <laughs> Dr. Kraft, yours are the shoulders on whom I have stood. Yes. <laughs> Funnily enough, I used that exact quote just this week when talking about Stephen Finney. Oh, fantastic. So, yes. I mean, but that's just it. In this field, we've had so many amazing mm. people yep. whose work we have to build on. And one of the things that's come out of this conference is somebody stood up there, um, I think it was yesterday, and said, we're not reinventing the wheel. And we're actually, we're wrong. We are actually reinventing the wheel. The wheel with all of the work we're doing with hyperinsulinemia, with low-carb diets, with ketogenic diets, with different strategies for managing Harris, 1924, identified type 2 diabetes as a disease of high insulin. Insulin, yeah. All of these people, again, with the, when they looked at, when they came up with this extract of insulin, they said, this is not to replace the dietary strategies we've got in place. <laughs> it is to augment. Right. That all got lost. Oh, We're reinventing the wheel. So we are reinventing the wheel, but we need to go back to these early papers and take the, the knowledge from our giants who have gone before right. and go, what did they have it right? Yeah. Where did we lose the plot? How do we get back on track again? There was a lot of, uh, as the dogma moved everybody in one direction towards reducing fat and, and the like, there were a lot of papers that were lost. They were, part, they were submitted and, and refused. And there was a lot of papers that were uh, admitted and refused. But the other issue, is, as I spoke about yesterday, is we've got a glucocentric model of treating diabetes. Yeah. And that has stemmed through from the earliest points of diagnosing diabetes has been glucose in the urine, glucose in the urine, right. glucose in the urine. Three and a half thousand years of glucose in the urine. Because somebody could taste it. Because somebody could taste place. it. Yeah. Is not, and actually one of the ways that um, doctors could diagnose that their patients had diabetes, especially older males, when they came into the surgeries, they would look at the shoes and feet. Okay. 
were there any dried white crystalline uh, patches on the shoes and faces oh of the dear. trousers? <laughs> yeah. And it's a case of, right, you've got glucose in the urine, I don't need to go any further. Yeah. <laughs> but even Banting in 1921, when he wanted to develop his extract of insulin. He's the Canadian who basically discovered insulin. He's the main name, but it was a collaboration. Yeah. Banting, Best, Best Collop and McLeod. Right. Right. The four of them, if the four of them hadn't worked together, yeah. it would have taken a lot longer. Mm. But it took other people as well. And Banting never injected all of these people with insulin. That had to be handed over to the patient's physician. He was never their physician. But, but in his notes, I've been reading the discovery of insulin, Michael Best, Blist, something like that, okay. a book done in the 1980s. Um, in Banting's notes, he said, will this extract, pancreatic extract, prevent glucose from going into the urine? Less than 100 years ago, physicians were still thinking of diabetes as glucose in the urine. Right. It wasn't until the 1960s, as I said, Dr. Kraft, early 1970s, that we've been able to analyze insulin. So all of the expanded pieces of research that was being done on diabetes from the 1920s was all around the management of glucose. Yeah. Now we need to recognize that Glucose in the blood is a symptom. Right. And we're of by treating diabetes. that as a symptomatic treatment. We're doing symptomatic treatment. We're yeah. not treating root cause. We're not understanding root cause. Yeah. Because a lot of people with diabetes, be it type one or type two, have got high levels of glucagon in the blood. Right. Six hormones to raise glucose levels, one to lower. Yeah. But people with type 1 diabetes, it's understandable they've that got was high six, levels. six hormones to raise, not sex hormones to raise. Yes, <laughs> yes, six. The number six goes between five and seven. Um, only one to lower. Right. With type 1 people, type 1 diabetes, insulin's main job is to oppose and balance glucagon. Mm. No insulin, of course you're going to have raised glucagon. Sure. People with type 2 diabetes... Some studies have shown they've got a high prevalence of raised glucagon levels. Interesting, yeah. So what's causing the raised glucagon if the insulin is high? Pancreatic insulin resistance. Is it pancreatic insulin resistance? In the alpha cell. Yeah. Or is it the primary defect in type 2 diabetes for at least some people with type 2 diabetes yeah. is a glucagon issue and it's a um, hypersecretion of glucagon so is the primary structure. glucagon resistance. Not glucagon resistance because I don't really know that you get glucagon resistance because the object of glucagon in the liver is to um, encourage ketogenesis, but more importantly, gluconeogenesis. Okay. Yeah. So glucagon, I don't think, becomes resistant in the liver. All that glucagon is filtering into the liver. Yeah. Churn, I mean, I don't know. I haven't, I haven't looked at it yet no. in great, great depth. I don't know if anybody has. Well, Tim Noakes is actually looking into it currently. Because yes, I understand that he is. I've been talking to one of his PhD students. Yeah, and he's, he's, we did an interview with him, and he said that could be the basis behind my insulin resistance as well. Because yes, we hyperglucagon anemia. Yeah, we have similar, Tim Noakes and I have similar... Uh, patterns for ketone production and glucose yep. production and energy. But it's yeah. a case of where does that unopposed glucagon fr come from? Which is the direction of causality? Uh. Which one comes first? Is it high glucose, then high insulin? Or is it insulin resistance, high insulin, causing a defect in the pancreas, which causes the hyperglucagon? Which one comes first, chicken and the egg? But if we're going to manage one, I think we have to manage both. Because I look at all of these people who um, somebody described them today as keto chasers. Now, please don't get me wrong. I think if you're managing type 2 diabetes, impaired glucose tolerance, right. you have got to get the insulin down to control long-term disease risk of cancer, Alzheimer's. Uh, and that yes. becomes a risk-benefit ratio in favor of uh, getting the insulin down at all costs. Yeah. We don't know what the risks are associated with high levels of glucagon, but we know we've got major issues if we don't control the insulin levels. Yeah. Then you've got the people who somebody referred to today as keto chasers. <clears throat> right. This might be the people in Silicon Valley who are trying to do the best things for their health and they've gone keto to prevent the long-term risks of developing type 2 diabetes. Right. But if they're getting the insulin down at all costs, what's happening to their glucagon levels? Yeah. So we need a glucagon assay. We need a glucagon yeah. assay. And in fact, we need to do the ratio of insulin to glucagon, really. Not just the ratio. Because you, you've just said yourself that you probably had high glucagon and high insulin at the same yeah. time. So your ratio might still have been one to one, yeah, right. but the absolutes yes. are sky high. Understood. We need to look at a combination of ratio 
and yeah, absolute. Yeah. I've got some blood samples that I'm hoping to look at when I get back to New Zealand do an okay. assay on those. But assaying glucagon, there is one place in New Zealand that's got a commercial lab and it's not my lab to do <laughs> commercial glucagon. It's too expensive for me to even consider. I've got no research funds. Yeah. But it's um, but I'm doing um, an ELISA type kit, but it's actually right. a multi kit. I'm going to look at glucagon, leptin, ghrelin, and nice. a few other things, yeah. and start because I think maybe leptin ghrelin also comes into the play. Looking at the ratios there, yeah, I know that with my uh, my own insulin that um, you see, I my father's family has uh, uh, diabetes too in it. My grandfather, I didn't know this until like a couple of years ago. They're all doctors, and nobody t- told me that. We have um, diabetes running in my family until I actually got it. And then they said, oh, yeah, that runs in the family. I'm like, gee, I wish you could have told me. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm actually finding that amongst a lot of my patients is they're becoming blasé to the fact that because there is so much type 2 diabetes around and everybody in the family's got it, oh, of yeah. course I'm going to you get it. You can't get blasé about that, though. Cause it's, and it's a case of, but did you realise we can do something about this? But it was also, though, what somebody else was talking about today. You've got a mother with gestational diabetes. Right. That's going to set up the fetus. Well, actually, not only with a mother with gestational diabetes, because in the case of my mother, she's a fruit bat. She, she, and during my gestation, she ate a lot of fruit. Now, okay, she was to, able to produce a lot I'm of going insulin. To, I'm going to rephrase this then. Okay. At the moment, we talk about it with mothers with right. gestational diabetes. If you've got gestational diabetes, you have so got insulin insulin resistance for hyperinsulinemia yeah. because gestational diabetes yeah. can be considered to be a subset of type 2 diabetes right. that only occurs yeah. during pregnancy. So, okay, so if you've got a mother with insulin resistance, hyperinsulinemia, yeah. may or may not be diagnosed with the glucose tolerance tests, that insulin and that glucose is all going to go into that baby. Yes. That's going well, to not ch- the insulin because the insulin doesn't pass a placental barrier. And the glucose does. So you've got your... Or the glucose does. And that glucose is filtering into the baby, which is going to make the baby's own pancreas. Exactly. And it's going to change the baby's brain as to how it deals with glucose. So the baby literally gets a a primer in the womb on how to become an adult type 2 diabetic. Yes. And so... And I believe that's what happened to me. It's generational. And what we learnt uh, and what was really new to me is it's not just... It doesn't just prime the female fetus to then become at risk of insulin resistance, hyperinsulinemia in their own pregnancies to feed it on through. It also primes the male fetus to become, and the genes that then get passed down in epigenetic expression, Hmm. the father with type 2 diabetes or insulin resistance, hyperinsulinemia, primes their own children, even if they marry a mother with normal insulin levels. So we've got... Things that are being passed down generation to generation to generation, yeah. genes and hormones. But if you also want to think about your family traditions, yeah, a lot of the family you pass down the food. You pass down the food. Right. You pass down the culture of food. Yeah. You pass down the fact that you give a chocolate when somebody's feeling happy, when somebody's right. feeling sad, when you want to celebrate something. Yeah. You've got your family, special family dinners that are treats. Yeah. And all of those things can influence things. So my hypothesis is that I, uh, I inherited some susceptibility to, to type 2 diabetes from my father's side. And in my mother's womb, because she is quite insulin sensitive and she had a high fruit diet, uh, that I was getting a lot of her sugar, she was able to make enough insulin and she was quite sensitive. So it never appeared as gestational diabetes for her. Even though she had a lot of sugar, she was disposing of it really quickly. But me, in development, I was getting... You were challenged. I was getting, I was getting a... Adult, I was basically getting a, 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 an entry course into becoming I mean, an adult to type 2 diabetic. You know, it would be absolutely fascinating, and I don't know if this can be done, but it would be absolutely fascinating to take a fetal blood sample yeah. of a, a during pregnancy of a mother with gestational diabetes yeah. to have a look at the insulin to glucose ratio and, in the child, yeah. Because it might actually be that the child has type 2 diabetes in the womb. In the womb. Uh, so, so one interesting thing. I, Tim I don't Noakes, know. That's a complete yeah. hypothesis. Thinking out loud. Tim Noakes said that one of the things that's interesting is when you cut the umbilical cord 
uh, of children, some of them go hypoglycemic yes. because they're producing a lot of insulin yes. and all of a sudden you cut the glucose. Yes. So I asked my father, because he's a doctor, if I was hypoglycemic and he didn't recall it. So, yep. um, But that would have been, di- yep. I would have said that would be diagnostic of there's a there's a type 2 diabetic in the womb. Yes, I, I would say so. as Well, not necessarily type 2 diabetic in the womb because it might just be hyperinsulinemic rather yeah. than type 2 diabetic. Well, I think we should agree that, that hyperinsulinemia is the root cause. It's and absolutely then, the root yeah, cause of diabetes. So. But when we're talking about with the medical, we, you know, we've just been talking about semantics and all the rest right, of it. Yes. <laughs> diabetes is still a disease of elevated glucose it's a symptom. in the blood. It's, it's, it's not a, a disease, it's a symptom. It's a symptom. It's a disease. <laughs> Dr. Kraft kept saying that hyperinsulinemia is occult diabetes or diabetes in situ. Hidden, yeah, occult as in hidden. Occult diabetes. as in hidden, yeah. yes. As opposed to pentagrams. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yep, pretty well. So it's so we, we, we're set up for things at the wrong point in time. So we need to change things. And yeah. Yeah, so it's been fascinating these last few it's days. It's been a great conference. So, so I'm going to go to action items. What can our listeners do uh, when it comes to their own diagnostics about their insulin? Is there anything they can do? Okay. If you have already been diagnosed with impaired glucose tolerance or type 2 diabetes, I'm sorry, you are hyperinsulinemic. Right. Right. If your blood glucose is down to normal levels, I'm sorry, I still can't tell you your insulin is under control. Yeah. But if you can get your ketones down yep. to a or well, up, but if you've got a reasonable level of ketones, having that amount of ketones says that your um, insulin levels have been sufficiently suppressed. Yeah, mine don't. I to to get mine over 0.8, I need to really fast for three days and do some I two hours of I, exercise. I personally don't believe that you need to get things to 0. 0.8, 0. 0.5 because you've just, no, but I'm, I'm just, just said you've, yeah. you've got to work so hard. Yeah. But if even if you're sort of getting to, to 0. 0.4, yeah. that says that at least part of the time during the day, your insulin has got to be low yeah, enough. That's true, yeah. Okay, you know, you, otherwise you would not be making any detectable ketones. Sure. Um, so that would be number one. For those people out there who are normal glucose tolerant and are concerned, mm-hmm. fasting insulin levels don't work. Right. Right. If you're going to get one insulin test off your doctor, yeah. do it, but have a 75 gram to 100 gram Ideally, glucose load. Go and buy some glucosaid, or no? I don't know. I don't know enough about glucosaid okay. really to know if it's just pure glucose. But if you go to the supermarket and buy some brewer's sugar, it's dextrose. Oh, okay. Okay, seventy-five to one hundred grams of dextrose in water. Yeah. Right, fine. Two hours before your blood test, drink that. Yeah. That's going to give you a a good enough guide. There's no hard and fast guidelines as to what your um. What's, what's healthy, what's not. But I'm going to say if it's over 30 micro units per mil, you need to be doing a little bit more work yeah. with your diet. And, of course, you can't be keto. You can't be fat adapted. You've got if you're to, fat you adapted, do not bother. Yeah, it's if not you're worth fat it. adapted, already yeah. on a keto diet, low-carb diet, do you, not bother with an insulin You're doing exactly test. what you should be doing. You're doing exactly <laughs> what you should be doing. Your results, it's just going to be expensive. I can just about predict your results at this point. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it's, 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 not, it's not worth doing. Yeah. So that's for people with normal glucose tolerance, not low carb adapted. For anybody else who doesn't want to go through that, take a cold, hard look at your diet. Yeah. I have how much sugar is in your diet? How much starch is in your diet? Can you go? Can you miss a meal and not and it not affect your mental performance, including grumpiness? Yeah. Right. If you cannot miss have a, somebody else take that data. Have somebody else take that data. Yeah. <laughs> but if you cannot miss a meal and go for six to eight hours without eating in between, that says to me that your carb dependent, inadequate fat burning stores. Right. Yeah. And that to me is is the first stages of where we go from there. Yeah. So I would suggest with your kids when they get to, I guess, in their mid twenties. Do the do the ghetto craft test, which you know they have the hundred hundred grams of uh, of, dex, of brewer's sugar two hours before a glucose uh, insulin test. And the funny thing about children is they will go into ketosis far easier than adults. But like a twenty five year old is an adult. Twenty five year old is an adult. But if you've got children, yep. and you know you yourself have got type two diabetes and paired glucose tolerance, and you're wanting to do the best thing for your children. Please keep them away from sugar and excess starches. Please don't let them have morning tea or afternoon tea. Let their bodies learn that fasting is okay. It will keep them metabolically primed. Wonderful. Wonderful advice. Let them enjoy the tides of insulin properly rather than being always at high tide. Yes, absolutely. Well, thank you very much, Catherine. That's been an awesome 
uh, podcast. Thank you. You're very welcome. Could you save your due for a little? Well, this was really interesting to me because of what I learned about Dr. Kraft just doing uh, the show and talking to Ivor, who introduced us to him in his work, yeah. or me anyway. And the fact that she has custody of the data she does. and is forwarding the cause makes me feel like I can sleep at night. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. It's outstanding. So anyway, thank you very much, Dr. Crofts. Um, uh, very much enjoyed talking to you. And I think it's time to have some food. What do you think? It's time for recipes. <laughs> <laughs> What you got, Carl? Well, what's really funny is that we both wrote in the show notes, it's a surprise. And <laughs> I think my surprise is going to be a little different from your surprise, because okay. my dish this week is sweet, filling, lovely, delicious body fat. Body fat? Body Eek. fat. <laughs> Eek. I'm fasting. <laughs> now, there's a there recipe. Go. It's a recipe. Uh, no. It's it takes a glass of water. <laughs> ab- no, 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 no. It takes it takes a few days. All right. Okay. <laughs> so the the ingredients on day one are some heavy cream. Okay. Or some coconut oil. Okay. Coffee, tea, mm-hmm. something like that. Yep. Mm-hmm. And salt. Yep. Because your first day, you always start off easy yeah. into a fast with a. I always a little start bit of fat. off with you a little start fat. With a fat. Fat fast. Yeah. Yeah. I start day. with a yep. fat fast on the first day. Yep. And you know, if if you like to have uh, a cocktail in the evening, now's your time to do it. Okay. You have some, you know, zero carb liquor or, you know, some sort of cocktail that has no sugar and uh, definitely not beer. Unless you live in Australia and you can get that burly big head beer that you guys drink down there. Yeah. Zero carb. So the next day, it's the, the ingredients are just salt and water. Right. <laughs> okay. And how about the third day? Uh, the third day, you know, salt and water also. And you, can, <laughs> you can continue on as long as you want. And uh, the more you eat, the the fuller you'll get and the more energy you'll have. And that's it. Body fat. That's that's Body my cop-out recipe that's, for the that's week. A, that's a real <laughs> cop-out. So, so i got to admit, I think the first day, I wouldn't count the first day personally. I start fasting straight on the salt and water. Yeah. But you got to do what works for you and only one person knows that right you know you got to find out what what is necessary for you to get to that fasted state exactly and uh and for carl he he it reliably fasts when he starts out this way so for him he's found that 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 works for him for me i just wake up one morning and decide not to eat and i just Mm. keep doing that until i decide to eat and it's usually three days later so that's how i fast that's awesome so that's my recipe. What's yours? My surprise. Well, my surprise is actually I'm going to do some pulled meat, which <laughs> you oh, know, big you, surprise, big surprise. So, but <laughs> this one is actually goat. Now, um, uh, one of the nice things about living in a in a multicultural city like Canberra is we have a fairly large Muslim population, and during Ramadan, of course, they go through a month of, of fasting during the while the sun's up. Yeah, and then at the end of Ramadan, they have a massive big feast. Uh, and goat is popular um, amongst some of the Muslim cultures. And so mm-hmm. a lot of the butchers have a lot of goat um, available. And then after the Feast of Eid, this is the feast after Ramadan, after the Feast of Eid has happened, it all goes out really cheap. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, right. So if, and, and here's the thing. Goat is delicious. Yes, it is. A lot of people don't know this. I mean, it's, it's, got, it's kind of lamb-like texture-wise, but the flavour, it's is intense. Like a, it's it's a it's intense and it's sweet. Mm. It's not uh, it's not sh- sweet from sugar. It's just a sweet, gentle, beautiful flavour. And if you like good lamb, mm-hmm. this isn't bad. You know, <laughs> no, no, <laughs> <laughs> no. If you. Uh, you're just mm. trying to get my goat now, aren't you? Uh, no. <laughs> you know, the first time that I had goat was actually mm. in um, Barcelona, Spain. Okay. In a restaurant called Cuatro Gatos for mm. cats. For cats? Which I had heard. <laughs> no, I didn't. Have, okay. Let me right, see okay. that menu. <laughs> hey, I need an interpreter here. Um, no, no. The, uh, there was a rumor that it was a favorite haunt of Pablo Picasso. Okay. But it was a roast leg of kid, which is baby mm. goat. And yeah. I got to tell you, that was some of the most delicious meat I've ever eaten in my life. 
Mm. Mm. Delicious. So this, the, so I got frozen goat shoulder, and this is uh, this is from butchers. They've decided I've sold all the goat for Eid. Mm. Now I'm just going to freeze it, mm. um, and I'm just going to try and sell as much as I can because I don't want to, because otherwise it's going to be in my freezer for a year. Right. Well, I I managed to get three goat shoulders for about fifteen dollars. Wow. Okay. So, which is great. Five bucks yeah. per, per shoulder. It's bone in. So, it had part of the rib cage as well. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, so what I did was I put it in a slow cooker, three, three shoulders frozen in a slow cooker, mm. just fit in. I put a little bit of water on the on the bottom of the pan, and this was this is like a, a crock pot style slow cooker. So sure. it's basically sixty Celsius, and you just leave it on for like 12, 13, 14 hours. Okay. And into that, I threw a couple of bay leaves. I always put bay leaves into um, to uh, all of my slow cooked meats, right. and I, I threw a whole lemon. And well, wow. actually, I, I sliced I sliced it in half, but a whole lemon sliced in half. Mm. And I wanted to get not only the the juice of the lemon. And you really want liquid at the bottom so so that it, the meat doesn't catch. So the juice is a little bit for that, but also I wanted to get the flavour of the the peel of the lemon right. because that's a beautiful flavour with goat. Yeah, I usually zest the lemon before I juice it and put the zest in there. Yeah, that's also a great idea. I also added some aromats, a little bit of thyme, a little bit of rosemary. Rosemary goes well with both lamb and goat and yeah. uh Time goes particularly well with mammal meat. So mm. um, I, I threw those in and then added a little bit of water just to make sure that there was it, that the meat didn't catch, and I just set it and forget it. Mm. And then I came back about uh, 12 hours later, and the meat was just starting to fall off the bone. So I got some forks, and I forked all of the meat off the bone. Yeah. And I, I, I put it back into the slow cooker, and the bones I put into a pressure cooker nice. with a little bit of water. Yeah. And a couple of vegetable bits that I had, I had like a, some cauliflower um, uh, stalks, and I had some um, a, 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 some sprigs of parsley that were a parsley due date. Mm. Threw those in with a bit of water into the pressure cooker for two hours, stock and basically time. made goat stock. Yeah, goat stock. Yeah, and so the the pulled meat. Um, in the pressure cooker, it once it's off the bone, it can be cooked for maybe another two or three hours, and it'll be it'll get more even more tender. And then what I do, as you probably know, is I bag it up into two hundred gram um, units, uh, yep. put put it into a Ziploc baggie, roll it up, put it in the freezer, and that comes out uh, whenever I need a meal of goat. And awesome, I managed to make fifteen meals. Fifteen. It's basically uh, three kilograms worth of goat meat. Um, makes 15 meals for me um, for $15, so a dollar a meal. That's so great. For two people. The keto is so expensive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and and goat is grass-fed, so, you know, it's it's it's, it's uh, perfect That's meat. great. So, so now you, now you have my... a mission, people, to go find a source of goat. Yeah, try some goats. Delicious. Oh, well, that's a show. It's a good one. And I promise that next week, not only will I have real food, but I'm going to do the Kitoki Fried Chicken Chocolate Parfait. Ooh, everyone likes a parfait. Yeah. Of course, if you have anything that you want to tell us, something we said wrong, something you don't agree with, some more research that you found to support or refute anything that we've said, send it by email to dudes at twoketodudes.com or post it on our website. And you can follow us on Twitter, Twitch, YouTube, and Instagram at Two Keto Dudes. And make sure to use the hashtag Two Keto Dudes. And of course, if you want to join the free ketogenic forum, it's forum.twoketo.com. And you can have a look around the ketogenic forum without needing to create an account by starting with success.twoketo.com. And if useless swag is your fancy, like t shirts, coffee mugs, and other junk with witty keto sayings on them, head over to gear.twoketo.com. And if you want a shot at getting some of that swag for free, join the Two Keto Dudes fan club. You'll be eligible to win something in every show. Go to fanclub.twoketo.com. And if you feel like supporting our forums and all the podcasts we produce, think about making a monthly pledge on our Patreon page at patreon.twoketo.com. And come to Keto Fest 2018. We're going to have a party, and this may be your last chance to join. That's right. Go to ketofest.com. You can also see all our podcasts and other videos on YouTube at youtube.twoketo.com. And check out my cooking videos at carlsketokitchen.com. And if you haven't already, go leave a review on Apple Podcasts. That's how new people get to know about what we do. Two Keto Dudes is brought to you by Two Keto LLC, who strives to support the low-carb community with podcasts and other publications. 
Keep calm, keto on, and fast when you can. Yeah, keep calm and keto on, Carl, and keto fest at least once a year. <laughs> right. And we'll see you next time on Two Keto Dudes. Two keto dudes.